It's becoming more popular every day as millions of people are changing their eating habits to include more healthy foods. Live food restaurants are springing up. Uncooking shows are appearing on TV. And celebrities are speaking out about the benefits of a raw vegan lifestyle. 100% raw food diet consists of fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, avocados, and you can eat some sprouts. Raw foods are foods that have not been fired over 110 to 120 degrees, so the enzymes and the oxygen are alive. I can't claim to be a raw food, however, I have at times been just strictly raw, and I try to be mostly raw regardless. Actually, the concept of a raw organic food diet as being the healthiest of choices has been around for a long time. It is the most natural way for animals and humans to consume food. Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine, believed in the body's innate ability to heal itself. He regarded the food we eat as powerful medicine. I believe that raw foods is a major transformative tool for people from, you know, dealing with any kind of illness or wishing to make any kind of major change in their lives. In Los Angeles, Vera and John Richter started America's first raw food restaurant in 1917. It lasted for 25 years. They called it the Eutrophion, which is Greek for good nourishment. It was a positive step in teaching Americans about the benefits of a raw food vegetarian diet. Another famous innovator, Ann Wigmore, first began making raw foods popular over 50 years ago. Ann used raw food to heal cancer. Today, her two original institutes still serve thousands of customers. Initially, Eating a raw food diet was nothing fancy. Just fruit, vegetables, grains, nuts, and seeds. And when I started this many years ago, I wasn't, I would say, fortunate enough to be able to eat some of the recipes that are available today, some of these delicious foods you can get in a raw food restaurant. What I did, it was basically very, very simple. You cut up a couple of grapefruits, you ate a few nuts, or you made yourself a, night, a big salad, or you put all your salad ingredients in a blender and blended it up. Today, there are so many exciting choices. Hi, my name is Kurt Tyson, and I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. I was chosen out of hundreds of applicants to be one of six people to participate in a unique opportunity. For 30 days, we ate nothing but raw, live food and took supplements under the direction of Dr. Gabriel Cousins here at the Tree of Life. Since then, I have returned to the real world and I'm excited to say that I have been diabetes free for over a year and a half now. Currently, I am attending Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine where I'm studying to become a naturopathic doctor because I want to help people live healthier lifestyles. I'm so excited to be your guide for this video and share with you information that would assist you and living raw for life. In this video, you will receive information from top experts and advocates on a variety of topics to ensure your success. If you are new to raw foods, you should check out the chapter starting out. Start small, take it a step at a time, and let the process grow rather than going extreme. Because once you break those cravings and you get away from actually wanting food that's bad for you, then it's all very easy. In the wisdom of eating raw, you will see that there's so many benefits to eating a raw vegetarian diet for your body, your community, and the planet. I, I think we've become so distanced from our food that we've lost sight of what real food is. You know, we spend a lot of time on our education to learn about our cars, to learn about our occupations, but what about this, the most magnificent machine you'll ever be given? Spend your time educating yourself about the body. It's a win-win thing. If you win, everybody else wins. If you win, the organic farmer wins. If you win, the organic health food store wins. If you win, you win. You get all the health benefits and your family wins. By now, you are ready to check out our topics. Clicking on this button takes you to a whole new menu. There's health and wellness, where you'll learn from leading medical experts that there is more to being well than just fighting off disease. Disease cannot exist where there is balance. Where there is balance, there is a sense of a person being at ease. And the body is a miraculous 
self-healing, self-repairing machine. And what gets a person well is you remove the causes of disease and the natural tendency of the body is to bring itself back to normal if given the chance. In Beating Diabetes, you'll hear how thousands of people are getting off their insulin by letting their body heal itself. In Weight Reduction, you'll discover how the body can balance itself with the changeover to a healthy, raw lifestyle. Basically make your own juices, you know, eat your raw nuts and the raw fruits and the salads, and you're on a very great diet that will give you everything you need and for your beauty, for your health and longevity. In optimal athletic performance, see real athletes and trainers who have effectively switched to a raw diet and learn their secrets that give them the competitive edge. Whenever you change your life, there's some kind of detox that's going to happen. Under detox and cleansing, you will know what to expect when you first switch to eating raw. Once you really get on the natural food and you have a little bit of education around it, you realize that it's not the food that's doing it to you. It's your body saying, time to get out the garbage. <laughs> Be sure to visit our photo gallery, where you can see all the experts and advocates in our program read their bios, and link to their websites. Of course, you'll want to watch the preview for the upcoming featured documentary, featuring me and my friends at the Tree of Life in Arizona. Also, don't forget to visit our website, www.raw430days.com. Be sure to check out our recipe sections on this too. Hey, if I can do it, so can you. And I'm loving living raw for life. I'm a clinical nutritionist in New York City. I've had a practice for 40 years. I've probably seen 25,000 people over the last 40 years. I've been eating 100% raw. I don't eat cooked food. What I encourage people to do is to eat, don't overdo anything, you eat a variety of different foods. Try not to overeat. Try not to eat in between meals. I was eating, you know, the sad diet, the standard American diet. Uh, I was eating as much steak as I could if I was lucky, you know. Anyway, I just noticed every time I'd eat a steak or a burger or something, I'd just want to go lay down on the couch after a while, and, you know, get a nap or something. Which is one of the effects of food that people do like. They like to get narked from their food. I, I know I do. Uh, get that pleasant feeling in your gut after, you know, Thanksgiving or whatever, and sit back on the couch. But it, it, as an energetic pursuit, I would say everything began for me where I just didn't want to have to go lay down, so I stopped eating red meat. And then eventually I stopped consuming dairy because I had tons of acne and red discoloration on my face and always mucusy. And, and then I'm like 23 or four or something, and this girl just happened to sit down next to me on this bus going from St. Louis to Oklahoma City. And she looks at me and she says, you're lactose intolerant. I said, what? She says, you need to stop doing dairy and all these symptoms you got, you know, which I just detailed, will go away. And I'm like, you know, I've been to all kinds of doctors and specialists who had told me they really didn't know what it was I was allergic to, definitely something. <laughs> and you're telling me it's dairy? Like milk does the body good, doesn't it? Well, anyway, I stopped. Three days later, all those symptoms went away, never to return. And uh, so that's how everything, everything was kind of began naturally. My name is Enway Nakai, and I'm the owner and culinary designer of Taste of the Goddess Cafe in Los Angeles. I moved to Los Angeles about four years ago from Chicago. And it was when I was in Chicago that I decided to adopt a raw food diet. And I had been vegan for a very, very, very long time, probably since I was about 18 years old, eating a mostly uh, cooked vegan diet. But um, I was sick a lot from eating a lot of tofu, a lot of seitan, a lot of meat substitute dishes. Um, and I decided to eat salads and to drink fresh green juices for about a week. My digestion cleared up from eating just salads and fresh juices. And um, I then just kept doing that and kept doing that, kept doing that. Uh, literally, like that next month, I went on a yoga retreat and um, I was in the salad line, still eating all salads, and happened to meet someone who was a raw foodist. 
and um, that person introduced me to my first raw food restaurant, which was in Chicago, called Karen's Fresh Corner. And from there, I started taking classes, and I bought books, bought all the equipment, um, and just turned my kitchen into uh, a laboratory for experimenting on food. And I then started to go online and to find recipes, and then there were raw food chat rooms and things like that. And just the more that I was seeking knowledge and information about it, um, the more things opened up for me. My name's Brendan Brazier. I'm from Vancouver, BC. I did triathlons professionally for six years, Ironman triathlon. I started when I was around 15 to doing triathlons. So I was eating lots of peanut butter and bread and, and things that were very high in calories, but I was tired and I didn't know why because calories measure food energy. I figured the more energy I took in through calories, the more energy I would have, but that wasn't the case. But making that transition more to raw, that problem totally cleared up and I could actually get away with eating 20 to 30% fewer calories and having more energy even though I just I didn't have the calories just because I was conserving it. So energy through conservation as opposed to consumption became a huge part of, of my program. And replacing the, the heavier foods, the peanut butter, the bread with salads and fruit, things that really will digest easily and that made a, a big difference. All, all growth is really about eliminating that which doesn't work because the body already has everything that it needs to um, replicate cells perfectly, to um, inhibit disease from forming. So I would just say in the beginning, just eliminate all things white from your, from your, your diet. Eliminate the sugar, eliminate the white flour. If you can't eliminate it totally, cut back tremendously on the dead meat products. Begin to eliminate that kind of thing and begin to add living food. Begin to add live juices, good water, good water that's alive into your, into your body temple. And I think the results will begin to speak for themselves because there will come a mental clarity. You know, people will come out of this haze that, that they think is normal and a clarity will begin to descend upon them. And once you taste that clarity, you don't want to you don't want to go back into the fog again. Most people aren't going to be complete raw fooders. I'm not a big promoter of that because I don't, I mean, most people are all or nothing in that mindset. My view is start to bring these things to bear. Start small, take it a step at a time, and let the process grow rather than going extreme. Some people go extreme because they can or because they have to, because they're in a, you know, a medical emergency. But most people, I think, have to be introduced, and they also have to see these foods are actually tasty and delicious. Wow. You know, if you think you're going to have to eat cardboard, you know, and that's your idea of raw food, you know, discipline only lasts so long. You're only going to do something that's painful so long. What gets people addicted, in a positive sense, is when they start to have their metabolism changed and they start to taste this food and the flavors and they get excited about it. What I've noticed just in the community here at Agape as people begin to uh, go through their transition diet and then ultimately add more raw, uh, tremendous energy. They all report back to me the same thing. They have all this energy now where they used to have that afternoon lag or uh, needing to nap for long periods of time. Um, that seems to dissolve. There's a lot of energy. And it lasts enough time where we know that it's not just a mental um, hypnotism where it's like they've heard about it for so long that, oh, I'm going to have this energy and then suddenly they have it and only lasts for a few days. We've noticed that people, they continue to have a tremendous amount of energy. Um, also, the mood swing that, we, that a lot of people have, and it's almost predictable. This, this seems to break the cycle of that downward spiral of their moods, and they're able to stay even for longer periods of time. One of the habits that it took me a long time to overcome was eating late at night, and I come to realize that was, wasn't very good for us at all, because it couldn't cause serious problems. So when you're eating a bad diet, you're eating late at night, you get up in the middle of the night and having a pastrami sandwich, then you're going to wonder why you have to sleep 13 hours a night, you're going to have to have two or three cups of coffee to, to, to be able to run on stimulated energy. When you eat, when you eat small amounts of food, you're eating nutrient-dense food that's raw, you could probably get by on two or three hours sleep a night without no problem, wake up, wake up fully refreshed. They gotta somehow get people in their family or circle who are supportive because otherwise it's really hard. I think really hard. And 
just for me to be more raw than cooked is generally about the people around me. You know, if I don't have someone, at least one person helping me. If you don't have that and you're like going home and there ain't one other person eating what you're eating, my God, that's, that's tough. But you're gonna have to learn to love a salad and learn to make a good salad and some good salad dressing. One thing I have to say about raw food nutrition and living food nutrition is when it comes to food preparation, I'm completely retarded. I mean, I can't even make a salad. It's totally ridiculous. So, you know, I've just oriented myself to doing it with blenders and just blending everything and just drinking that. That's how I live. You've got to at least open yourself up to the possibility that you can do it. And then the universe will just say, hey, check this out. Look at this. You could have this. Anybody can go down to the local health food store and have them make a juice up for you. The innovative ability to create our reality by the way we speak and by our will is ultimately capable of doing anything. Just start. Start doing something. Start taking those steps and it doesn't matter how small they are in the beginning. It may take someone on a standard American diet, it may take a year to transition. It may take two years in some cases. But that's okay, because once you break those cravings and you get away from actually wanting food that's bad for you, then it's all very easy. Another thing I always tell people is to don't be so extreme with it at first. Um, when, I, when I first started eating raw, I, I, was, I was eating completely raw and then sometimes I was eating cooked food. You know, it's just really important to kind of go with the flow and do what your body wants to do. And even now, I mean, there's some times that I'll, I may have some steamed brown rice or I may steam vegetables, especially like in the winter times or have warm soups or something like that. In the summer times, because it's hot, I eat mostly fruits. I don't really even eat salads, you know, and I drink a lot of coconut water and a lot of water. So, you know, a lot of people, they're always wondering, well, like, if you're eating just fruits, you're not getting your vegetables and that sort of thing. And what I always have to say to that is, I've been eating like this for eight years and I haven't been sick. I haven't had a headache, I haven't had a cold. Um, I've never had the flu. Um, so it's like, I must be doing something right. Well, I think first you've got to see what's going to make you actually do this. And I think when people experience a change or a transformation, there's a chemistry to that. There's elements that have to happen. The first thing is satiation. You know, if, you, if your favorite meal is prime rib and lobster and you eat it breakfast, lunch, and dinner, there's a point in which you get satiated. It's not enough anymore. It doesn't please you. And satiation makes people start looking for an alternative. That usually isn't enough to push them over the edge. Usually it takes for them to start to get a point where they really get frustrated, where it's not just satiated, but now I'm not getting rewarded. I keep eating this way, living this way, and I'm not happy about the outcome. Then people get to a threshold where it's like, okay, I'm done. You know, this is enough, enough already, got to shift. And when that happens, that search becomes a hunger. They really look for a new answer in their life. And then when that happens, usually they get an insight. They start to say, oh my gosh, it's my diet. Or, oh my gosh, you know, I'm addicted to this food. Or, oh my gosh, my relationship's a reflection of how I do this. I go for comfort and I never go through to what really matters. You know, I never face up to it. And that insight creates an opening where they have a chance to make a change. But what you have to do is at that moment, you gotta take some action. If you don't, it's like the opening closes and you start all over and you have to go through satiation and dissatisfaction and threshold all over again. So I say to people, grab the opening, grab the insight. You know, being dissatisfied is a great thing. It can produce drive in you. And when you're going to do it, find something that you know you can do in a lasting format. If you're an extremist and you really live extreme, then maybe it's go pure raw food and you'll love it because you're a new person. But if you're not that, if comfort is really important to you, then I'd start to explore. What are some of those raw foods that I really like? I'm not forcing myself to do this. I'm really enjoying it. And I'd introduce 20%, 25% of those raw foods. Then the energy starts to take over. You start feeling better. And you'll say, okay, what else can I add? And gradually, hoping you get yourself to 50, 60, 70 percent. And when you get to that point, you may not be perfect, but damn, you have a lot of energy and you feel a vitality that you've never felt before in your life. And that is the positive addiction. Raw food is the best way to have the cleanest energy. You know, it's like. We take so much care about what kind of fuel we put in our car, what kind of oil, this, that, and the other. Like our car, we really care about sometimes more than the fuel that we're looking at putting in our bodies. It's cleaner burning fuel. A live food cuisine and lifestyle 
It's a powerful way to heal both yourself, the ecology of the planet, and the consciousness of the planet. The government has a lot to do with our beliefs, you know? I mean, they are pretty well uh, controlling what we're told. I mean, the American Dairy Association, the American Meat Packers Association, I mean, they pretty well tell you that you have to have animal products to survive, and this just is not the truth. How can you think, logically, that eating a dead animal can make you healthy, or to prolong your life, or to make you beautiful, or to make, give you energy? How can you think? I don't understand people's logic with this. Oh, I gotta have meat, you know, protein, you know, it's so high in protein, yeah! But the body is paying such a high price by you eating this flesh. Uric acid, cholesterol, worms, fish too, chicken and turkey, same stuff, right? You are getting, you know, and, and also when the animal is slaughtered, you know, that adrenal, the fear that goes to the animal. You don't think that the, the animal is knowing when it's going to get killed in the butcher house? It knows for sure, I am positive. And when you eat it, so you don't get just the cholesterol to clog your arteries, the uric acid, the fat, you know, the dead blood, and sometimes meat is sold, and they color it, and they put nitrates in it to, to look like fresh pink meat. It should be gray if they didn't do the preservatives and everything else. But the adrenal poisoning and all that crap you're taking in there, just to get some protein, and you can go to the plant world, raw nuts, avocados, grains, sprouted grains. I truly believe that it's not a natural human instinct to eat dead flesh. It is a learned experience. If you were on a desert island and you hadn't eaten in weeks and weeks and weeks, and there was a dead cow floated up on the island and you had a bushel of apples, where do you think your instincts would take you? If we see a dying sick animal, it isn't our response to pounce on it and eat it. It's to maybe take it to a vet, at the simple worst, to step over it, but it isn't to pounce on it and eat it. My carnivorous dog, it is his natural instinct to eat dead flesh. So I think this myth that we live with that we need protein for strong bones and to build teeth and hair, it's exactly what it is and we have bought into it. Teachers in school get information from the big companies to teach you what you should eat, that you need the food pyramid. Fortunately, to agree, they are expanding this. They are adding more and more fruits and vegetables because people are realizing that they feel better. Even the American Cancer Society says that you shouldn't be eating so much red meat. Why kill an animal so I can enjoy my meal? I think it's like, that is like a murderous thing. I mean, you know, if I didn't pay the butcher uh, to buy a piece of steak or a piece of chicken or turkey, you know, if I didn't pay that money to get that food in the first place, there wouldn't be the demand on the butcher to kill that animal. So we have to take personal responsibility. You know, we, we've kind of turned our back on local produce and we've turned our back on local farmers and local people who use the, the, the community and rely on the community to, to make a living um, because of the convenience of a chain store. You know, we go to those places just because I can take care of all my shopping needs in one place. My brother, who is the biggest, cheapest human being on the face of the earth, and I love him more than anybody, He'll go to seven stores when he shops, just because he'll go wherever he can get the best deal. And he'll go to one place, and it's like, well, why would I buy tangerines there? Because over here, you know what? They're a nickel cheaper a pound. And he'll go to all these places, and especially during the summer, he'll go to the farmer's market and just buy those things that he could buy at a grocery store from the local farmers because he knows that he's supporting his local economy. He's supporting people whose money is gonna go right back into his own economy. And for me, I think that's the biggest thing that we, we should start to look at things that are grown naturally, things that are grown in your backyard. I, I think we've become so distanced from our food that we've lost sight of what real food is. But I'll never forget an incident. I was at a party that I had catered and they asked me to speak a little bit about my food, which was a raw food diet that I had catered. And there, there were a bunch of doctors there and they had brought in two nutritionists to speak about health. And one of the biggest travesties was someone asked one of the nutritionists, is there a difference between organic and non-organic? And the nutritionist says, government studies have shown that there is absolutely no difference between organic and non-organic. I mean, how can you say this? Everybody knows now there's a, you can go to a farmer's market and pick up a strawberry and even taste a difference. You can see a difference, but government controlled licensing says 
that there is no difference. And most of the people, because of all of the toxicity in their bodies, they're asleep. They don't stop and think that, that this doesn't compute, that this doesn't make sense. So what I say is the best thing to do is arm yourself with as much education as you can on every chance that you can because, you know, we spend a lot of time on our education to learn about our cars, to learn about our occupations, but what about this, the most magnificent machine you'll ever be given? Spend your time educating yourself about the body. How many people knew the stomach was just a tiny little sack in there? We think of it as this whole area to fill up three, four times a day. If we educate ourselves and then we detox and cleanse because that detoxing and cleansing, I'll come back to that. It's these layers of toxicity that are closing our minds, that are putting us to sleep so that we don't look at the reality of what's being said. So we just kind of take all this information as, yeah, we kind of sleepwalk through life and then as we get sick, we sleepwalk even further. I'm saying, wake up. There was, a, there was a, a, a cook, and I think it was Jamie Oliver, I can't remember who it was, um, but I'm, I'm thinking it was Jamie Oliver in the UK, went into a classroom with kids and blindfolded them. And he says, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna have you guys, you know, you know, smell some things. Tell me what, tell me what they are. So he blindfolds the kids, and the one kid smells it, and he goes, uh, he goes, it's, he goes, it's hand soap. He goes, it's, it's hand soap. It's what you wash your hands with. And the other kid goes, no, 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 no. It's dishwashing liquid. It's what you put in the, in the dishwasher to wash your, to wash your dishes. And they take the blindfold off, and the kids are sitting there staring at a lemon. You know, so that this is, this is what we associate these things with now. These odors, these things that are food products are now byproducts. And it starts in the home. It starts with parents. It starts with what you pass down to your kids. I grew up in a house where my parents and my mother cooked dinner every single day. There was not a day. My mother, and it wasn't like she was a stay-at-home mom. She worked all day and she came home and she cooked dinner because it was important. It was important to build this ritual of the family sitting down and having a meal together. And I think it's one of those things that is, it's so important for families to understand, especially kids to see, that food matters, to understand where food comes from. We had a garden in our backyard every summer. For as long as I can remember as a little kid, I'd be out there playing in the dirt, pulling carrots out of the, out of the, out of the ground and washing them off and eating them fresh out of the ground. Celery, cucumbers, tomatoes, green beans, cabbage, lettuce. You know, we grew everything. We grew so much food and then we would can it and have it in the winter. Um, you know, I, there, I had such a great relationship with food growing up and I think that that's completely distanced. From, uh, from everyone. And people say, well, we don't have time, or we don't have money, or, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's just, it's not that important. And I think that, uh, I think there's a backlash now. I mean, I think there is a turn of the tide where people are realizing, you know what, it is important. And we are missing this, this element of our lives. And, and hopefully it will come back. You know, between the food industry and the drug industry and the medical industry, were, they're very successful. They're spending their money wisely, and it's their businesses to now to sell their products, and they're 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 winning over the minds of Americans to think that we're that we're actually doing better by spending all this money on healthcare and drugs. And in, in reality, even the science that doctors are learning in the medical journals is not accurate. It's that's even biased in favor of drugs because it's because the science is produced and and written and drawn up by the money who's, by the people who are selling the drugs. So I think that you know it's it's a it's a difficult thing we're going through, and I think that. Um, we're coming to a certain crisis in America because, it, because healthcare costs have skyrocketed to the degree that businesses can't function anymore. And people and mug drugs are getting more expensive and we're not seeing the benefits. We're, not see, we're spending more and more money on healthcare, but we're not seeing a healthy population for it. So people are starting to smarten up. They're starting to say, well, maybe, maybe this isn't all cracked up. It's to be just taking more and more drugs. Maybe drugs are not the answer. I think, so it's, I think the way it's coming around now is because I think they've pushed the economic envelope almost too far. And now people are going to start looking for other means of reducing health care costs. And that's where good nutrition and uh, proper lifestyle and perhaps even cleaning up the environment might be beneficial for health costs. There might be a, another economic factor fighting against this idea that drugging of America is the answer to our health problems. There might be another factor coming up. There might be a, and they might be coming to a, um, a conflict and we might see more effort, more winning of, a, of people with nutrition and nutrition and environmental concerns and people actually looking to remove the cause of disease instead of just treating people after they fall off the cliff and land at the bottom and smash up their bodies. We live in a culture which tells us that the earth belongs to us. And when ownership is implied, then the idea that we could do whatever we want and not have to 
even consider how would our actions impact the others, whether they be other animals, other plants, the water, the soil, the air. At first, it seems like this is a, um, uh, this is a great privilege. Oh, the earth belongs to me, it is mine. But ultimately, it leads, of course, to uh, degradation of human beings and the earth as we're seeing more and more at this time of global crisis. I think we could all agree that we're at a um, global crisis. And I think there are perhaps three things that could be helpful in considering this global crisis. Number one, there's a global crisis. <laughs> Number two, we're causing it, we meaning human beings. And number three could be most of us don't have a clue about number one or number two. And um, the situation that we are finding ourselves in and the uh, rise of obesity and diabetes and cancer and depression and pharmaceutical drug use and recreational debilitating drug use and TV, which is another form of debilitating drug use. You could look at it as we're a culture of low self-esteem. The average person in our culture has low self-esteem. That is really the disease we're talking about, the disease of, of low self-esteem. Where this all begins is in our own heart. When in sports we used to say, you know, does that team have heart? Do, are we playing against a team that has heart? Why, why don't we say, why are we playing against a team that has mind, right? When we used to play tennis, does that person have the heart to win? It's the heart is where your soul is. That's where you have that ability to say, I am going for it. I am going to win no matter what. I'm going to make it happen no matter what. And in fact, it's not a win-loss thing. It's not like if you win, someone else loses. It's a win-win thing. If you win, everybody else wins. If you win, the organic farmer wins. If you win, the organic health food store wins. If you win, you win. You get all the health benefits and your family wins. If you win, all the people around you, they win, all your friends. This is ultimately the greatest win-win-win strategy ever, is deciding inside ourselves that we're worth it and we can do it. Nobody wants to give up choices. Nobody wants to give up convenience. So making things convenient, knowing where you can get food that you enjoy like this, knowing how to have things that are on the run available to you so you don't get to that threshold where I gotta have something right now. That's how you get yourself where you have more balance. Uh, in the moment, you know, it all comes down to what do you value most? You know, I always say to people, nothing you know, tastes as good as fit feels, as energetic feels. And if you get associated to that, then you start making new choices. How do we make that change? It's actually totally easy. It starts right in your backyard. It starts on your porch. It starts with your house plants. It gets back to loving plants, loving the soil, loving the earth, giving back something instead of just taking away. Ultimately, it starts at home. When you begin to eat in a way which connects you more to the earth and to your own self, which a raw food vegan diet does. You actually feel the effects of it right away in a po positive way. You feel more alive. You feel more grateful. You begin to wake up to your own confidence, your own at easeness. What could we eat that would cause the least harm to the earth and all earthly beings? That's our main criteria. Not what would make me most healthy, not even what tastes best, all those, though those are secondary considerations. Our main consideration is not harming others. And so um, part of that is not over consuming, no matter what, whether you're consuming lettuce beings or, or chicken beings, uh, less is best. When you begin to be more connected, then you begin to feel that what you do actually matters, not only to your own health and well-being, but to the greater world around you. In the end, it's not just about raw food or about biodiesel. It's about a sustainable lifestyle. It's about waking up and saying, hey, is this work or does it not work? It's not about good or bad. It's what works and what doesn't work. And 
you know, the more that we do that, the more everyone does that, it's going to be a better world. It's going to be a happier world, and we're going to be leaving a much better world to our kids. There's a train going a million miles an hour towards death, pain, fire, destruction, famine, greed, hate. And there's also another train that you can get on that's going another direction towards love, laughter, happiness, joy, growth, beauty, longevity. It's a choice, and that choice is always available. You choose. We have an unbelievable epidemic of diabetes in this country. The rates of diabetes are skyrocketing, and we have a, a, a parallels to the epidemic of obesity. We have an, the most overweight population ever in the history of the human race, and it's still growing fatter. More people today are taking drugs than ever before. Type 2 diabetes has tripled in the last 10 years. That's a lifestyle disease. What most people don't know is that diabetes can be cured. How do I know? I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. However, under the care of Dr. Gabriel Cousins, my life was totally transformed. Dr. Cousins had me eat only raw foods and take live supplements for 30 days. My glucose levels are normal, and I still do not need to take insulin. So what is diabetes? What are the causes, symptoms, and most importantly, the cure? This chapter addresses those issues and much more. Diabetes is a form of disinsulinism, meaning that a person is either secreting adequate amounts of insulin, but the body's not able to utilize it, or the body is not secreting from the pancreas adequate amounts of insulin. In either case, the person's blood sugar becomes elevated and stays elevated and therefore requires some form of intervention to lower it. Diabetes is caused by a combination of factors, but it's mostly caused by, um, by fat on the body, especially fat on the midsection, because abdominal fat represents fat that's stored internally in your tissues and around your organs. So fat blocks the absorption of insulin, and then your pancreas is asked to produce more insulin in response to the, um, the blockage effect, the blocking effect of all the extra fat in the body. And eventually the pancreas poops out over it can't produce so much insulin. And now it's not producing enough insulin for the body's needs. People got to realize that there are two forms of diabetes, the type that needs the insulin and the type that just is diabetic because they're heavy. Now the type that has diabetes because they're heavy actually is producing more insulin than the normal individual. In most cases of type 2 diabetes, the body is still producing sufficient amount of insulin for a thin person, but just not enough insulin for a fat person. And if the person loses weight, they can become non-diabetic, defined by the fact that they don't need any medication to keep their blood sugars in the normal range. What are the big causes of diabetes? High sugar, number one. 20 years after sugar is brought into any culture, there's an outbreak of diabetes. Two, meat and dairy in the diet, high animal fat is right up there, right behind sugar. Three, caffeine. One cup of coffee will increase your insulin resistance by 33%. Cigarettes do the same thing. They greatly increase your insulin resistance, which is a precursor to diabetes. Pesticides and herbicides and heavy metals tend to block the uh, function of the insulin system and increase your insulin resistance. The symptoms of diabetes type 2 when they first come on is excessive urination or sweet urine. And that symptom is a clue as to what the cause of diabetes is. Excessive urination is an inability to hold on to minerals or an inability to utilize minerals. It's an illness that affects the pancreas. And one thing that we are not taught about the pancreas, but is true, is that the pancreas has the largest draw or pull for trace minerals of any organ or gland in our body. Then both type one and type two, 
If they are throwing in a lot of carbohydrate and a lot of starch and a lot of high glycemic food into the bloodstream, you know, you're, you're eating cakes and breads and, and pastas and things like that, either the body's going to have to produce a lot of insulin or you're going to have to inject a lot of insulin. You reduce that kind of carbohydrate or sugar load, your insulin requirement is going to go way down. That's the first thing. The second thing is the kind of foods you eat is going to determine the sensitivity of the insulin, whether it is made by your body or whether you inject it. The problem with insulin, of course, is that insulin is an atherosclerotogenic agent. That means that insulin promotes the progression of atherosclerosis. And insulin increases their appetite. It makes them eat more and makes them become more overweight and then become more diabetic and need more drugs and more insulin and more, you know. And the problem is not insulin deficiency, it's insulin resistance. The the whole approach of using insulin to alleviate diabetic symptoms is a band-aid approach. And it's actually a dangerous approach because insulin is a synthetic chemical that is mimicking the body's natural insulin. And it's good. There's a lot of assumptions that go into this understanding that, hey, we're just using the same compound as your body produces. It's not the same compound because we're only talking about one aspect of the fabric of reality. And part of that fabric that flows one direction is chemistry. Part of the fabric that flows the other direction is the love, the overall symbiotic relationship of all the different chemicals in the body to each other, and all the difficult factors. So to put just one part of it in there, just that insulin, it's a band-aid approach and eventually all the problems still show up anyway. And then there's insulin resistance develops where the body starts to resist this unnatural form of insulin and it's kind of just prolonging the inevitable. There's also a fact of nutrient nutritional um, imbalances and deficiencies that makes the pancreas not responsive. It was, you know, so there's a certain loss of function in the pancreas due to the lack of phytonutrients and the variety of the symphony of nutrients we need for normal tissue function. In other words, the cells don't function at full efficiency when you just supply them with some macronutrients. They need a full symphony of, 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 of the full complement of you know, the artistry of thousands of different discovered and undiscovered chemicals to maximize cellular function. Attempting to alleviate the symptoms of diabetes type 2 using pharmaceutical medications, mineral deficient food, non-absorbable supplements is moot. It's not going to work. We have to get right down to the cause of the problem, and the cause of the problem is the poor quality of food. Not just the way that it's raised, but the soil quality, the mineral density of the food when it reaches the market, the whole entire way that food is actually eaten, the processing of it, the heating, the roasting, and all those things are decreasing the mineral availability of what's there, and there's not much there to even begin with. We see so much money being spent on diabetes research, and we see so much money um, just being wasted uh, in a lot of ways. You know, whether whether it's through research grants or it's through different uh, different drug plans, and especially especially when you look at groups like the American Diabetes Association, which continues to get money from people like Cadbury Schweppes or Pepsi or candy companies. You know, the, these are the people who are who are financing studies, you know, you have to, you have to ask yourself whose best interests are being served. When you're dealing with something like diabetes, which is a mineral deficiency syndrome, and coupled with that, a sugar addiction syndrome and carbohydrate addiction problem, and then you're taking those people and you're putting them onto natural food, you're getting two effects. One is they're getting real nourishing food for the first time, so you're gonna have an inhibition of appetite almost immediately, where they're suddenly not gonna be hungry because they're getting what they need. And then you're gonna have a detoxification effect, which is the effect of pulling the plug out of the bathtub, a draining away of all the stuff. The good stuff is pushing out the bad, because once you really get on the natural food and you have a little bit of education around it, you realize that it's not the food that's doing it to you. It's your body saying, time to get out the garbage. A person that's a, a diabetic, exercise is critically important because 
The amount of sugar you're going to spill is based on the calories you're taking in and the calories you're, you're, you're burning up in your daily activity. So if you're a diabetic, if you're eating blended salads and a lot of greens, you're not eating a lot of fruit, you're eating some nut pâtés, you're going to be burning up everything you're taking in. There isn't anything to be left over to spill sugar. That's the key. Years ago, before they had insulin, people that were diabetics, they starved them. Their blood sugar went down, but some of them died from starvation. So now we have the information available, especially with the greens, understanding that greens are secondary sunlight. They are for an efficient person. They provide a lot of energy. You definitely can get into a, a healthy diet, be on a low calorie diet, slow down your aging process, enable your body to restore itself, to restore its ability so you will not be functioning like a type two, uh, you know, like any kind of a diabetic. You just don't give individuals food that are gonna make the blood sugar go up. You concentrate on, on, on protein foods, you eliminate a lot of the dietary fats, uh, you increase a lot of the dietary fiber, uh, you increase a lot of the vegetables, fruits in a little bit more moderation, and you're gonna get dramatic results. Type two diabetes is very much related genetically. 85% of the people with type two have someone in their family who, who, who has a genetic tendency. And now we need to be very clear. Genetics load the gun. A culture of deaf lifestyle pulls the trigger. So we can't say, oh, it's my genetics. That's a cop out. What we are saying is, if you lead a, a healthy lifestyle, you will upgrade your genetic expression so you will not get diabetes. Autoimmune diseases such as diabetes represent, well, autoimmune uh, is essentially a Latin way of saying self-destruction. And this is what autoimmune diseases are, so that the relevance about, about these is that they're really brought on by the individual. And it's their own system uh, acting in a sense of overly act, overacting perhaps, or, or at least targeting self. I know one, one woman in particular, she's been a, a type 1 diabetic for um, over 30 years. She follows the best diet I have ever seen. She's a raw fooder. She doesn't eat much in the way of fruit. She got her insulin all the way down, but she's never been successful in uh, coming off her insulin. So everybody's a unique individual. Now, diabetes is a killer, but diabetes almost never comes alone. And the problem is, if you have a therapy for diabetes and you focus just on diabetes, you miss the larger picture. There is disharmony in the person. It may be a combination of spiritual, emotional, intellectual, creative, or cellular harmony that is out of balance. So in a case of patients with diabetes, it's a self-destruction process of uh, life not being sweet enough, not, they're not being good enough, that, uh, that they will never make it, or their parents are, make them average. You know, it's the kind of thing like when a student comes home with a report card with four A's and a B. And the parents spend all the time talking about, well, how the heck did you get a stupid B? without ever mentioning the fact that they did the four A's. It, the parent's intention, of course, is, well, you know, you could do better. But by saying that, what they really emphasize to this child is not good enough. Almost inevitably, go back into their history, and you will find that they came from developmental situations that compromised them and disempowered them with limiting beliefs that were programmed into their subconscious mind. As they got older, not even knowing the subconscious mind was there, not even knowing that it's working 95% of the day from their little narrow conscious view looking at the world, they're a victim. It's not me, I, I, I have all the great intentions. So I don't know why I'm sick. And the issue is, can I change it? Not by the conscious mind alone. You need something to push it into the subconscious mind because that's the source of the problem. So until you examine the interconnectedness of all these different things and realize we're not dealing with nouns. See, as you, as you approach your topic, this is diabetes. Okay, 50 people tell me how you treat diabetes. It's not going to do any good to anybody. Look at it as a verb, not a noun. As a verb, you don't have diabetes, you're diabetesing. All right?
you are processing, and processes can be changed. We've had thousands of patients come in taking the diabetic drug and systematically get off of it very quickly, never to have, never to have it uh, used again. Diabetes is reversible. I personally help countless numbers of people improve the quality of their life to where they no longer required insulin or had substantial reduction in it. And as long as they maintained healthy choices and surrendered unhealthy choices, they could reasonably expect to maintain a normal blood sugar level. But it's not just me that can do this, it's anybody can do it. And I know people look inside their life and see the stuff that they want and they go out and get it. And if you see that you want to be healed, you'll go out and get it. For me, when I see something like this, and it's, it's something so easy and so affordable in a lot of ways that you know, that you could turn around somebody's life where they're not suddenly becoming, or they're not going to live in a lifetime reliant on medication. It's like, why haven't we done this before? Why hasn't this study been done before? Why haven't people heard about things like this? There was a friend of mine who was diabetic. I sent him to the website and he said, how's this possible? He's been type 1 diabetic uh, for years, years. I think it hit him when he was 12 or 13, you know, somewhere in that range. And he's, he's about my age now, like 35, 36. And I showed him the trailer, and he's like, that's impossible, I can't believe it. And he says, you know what, I'm gonna, he goes, I'm gonna go raw, I'm gonna try it out. And so he went raw, and I don't know how many weeks it was that he went by, but his, basically his, his, his everything became so balanced and even, you know, it's like, like the dro numbers dropped, and he became completely regulated. And he, t and he, talked, he talked to his doctor, and his doctor, uh, he basically talked to his doctor on the phone and said, here's what I'm doing. The doctor's like, oh, that doesn't work, you know, you shouldn't do that. But he saw his numbers change, and he saw himself feeling better, and uh, got to the point where he didn't have to didn't have to do that, you know, over the course of the day, which is it's it's amazing, it's amazing. So basically, it brings back responsibility to the individual for their health, rather than the perception that they've been provided over years and years and years that they're more or less victims, you know, and they're frail biochemical devices where everything out there could destroy them and it's like this is so incorrect. Some people if their mind isn't right they can have this microbiotic diet, they could eat the raw food. If their mind isn't right that's that's the weak point, okay? So it's not that the food alone will do it but the food with the mind together will do it. We've lived for so long where we kind of enjoy abusing our bodies. Why, why do we want to suddenly start taking the time to take care of it? You know, we drink, we smoke, we, we eat poorly, we don't exercise. You know, I think that uh, to suddenly make that complete 180 degree turn and say, I'm going to start eating well and, and, and take care of myself is, it's, it's, it's a whole nother life. The AMA, the whole medical institutions, I grew up in that world. Both my parents, both my mom and dad are medical doctors. Nobody knows that world better than me. I've been right in the middle of it my whole life. That's an outdated, antiquated model of reality. It's led us into the situation we have now. We have more cancer, more diabetes, more problems now than ever before. We have more pharmaceuticals, more doctors, more medical institutions, hospitals, etc. now than ever before. I believe that the definition of insanity is doing the same things over and over and over and expecting a different result. My career in science and medicine really started at Amherst College where I published my first paper in biochemistry and biophysics and then went on to Columbia Medical School where I was also doing biochemistry research and began to really approach this whole thing as a scientist. What I learned at Columbia Medical School, which is a great medical school, was symptom focus, relief of symptom with the pharmacological approach. And even though I was really expert in pharmacology, from my biochemistry background, I saw, wait, there's something not right here. How do we go to a deeper level of healing? And that took me into more holistic healing uh, before, this is in the 60s, before many people even heard the term, including myself. But I just said, as a scientist, I have to see what works and it's going to heal per people permanently. And 
That took me into training people and educating people and ultimately creating the Tree of Life Rejuvenation Center where we can create an all-encompassing environment that people could really get a taste of what it's like to really be healthy. Most of the people who come to see me have health issues and how I handle that, I make people aware of lifestyle changes. I focus on lifestyle changes. I encourage people to understand that the human body has God-given remedial capabilities. It has the ability to heal. If you create the right internal environment by leaving certain things out of your lifestyle, your body will rise to the occasions and can respond in a way that some people think would, uh, would be exaggeration or even quackery. I've seen some miraculous things happen in a very, by the very simple, the simplest of changes in a person's lifestyle. And the body is a miraculous self-healing, self-repairing machine. And what gets a person well is you remove the causes of disease and the natural tendency of the body is to bring itself back to normal if given the chance. One of the leading killers in the United States is cardiovascular disease. And we now know that 90% or more of cardiovascular disease can be avoided by changing lifestyle. Okay? Uh, and cancer, which they always said was genetic, they never found really any cancer genes. And the fact that it takes a 10 to 15 genes, a coordination of 10 to 15 specific genes to kick a cancer off, the concept that this is a random probability is not very likely either. So that even the American Cancer Society in the last year uh, made this announcement, the first time they made it, I think it's still a conservative estimate, but they say 60% or more of cancer is totally avoidable by changing lifestyle. I can give you a pill to lower your blood pressure or raise your blood pressure. I can give you a pill to make your heart beat slower or heart beat faster, to make you urinate more or urinate less. We can go to the health food store. We can get an herbal product that can make your heart beat faster, make your heart beat slower, to make you tired, to, put, to wake you up or to put you to sleep. But the efficacy of the pharmacologic substance, whether natural or not, is proportional to its toxicity. They don't work because they fix anything, they work because they're actually blocking or interfere with the natural body process. Very often, the symptoms of disease could be the body trying to repair, rejuvenate, and detoxify from the cause of disease, from the stresses on the body. One of the leading causes of our early death is eating food, any kind of food. And the reason is this, is that uh, in the byproducts of digesting food are free radicals. And the free radicals are like the carbon monoxide that comes out the exhaust pipe of a car as a byproduct of the, of the car running. As much as the carbon monoxide can kill us, the free radicals kill us. Uh, I had the opportunity to work as a staff physician for Nathan Pritikin. Uh, Nathan Pritikin, as you may know, houses patients and puts them on a very low-fat diet and strict exercise regimen. And I was uh, working with him in 1976. And what was so dramatic, as far as I was concerned, was that very early in, in my learning and practicing of medicine, when I was working for Pritikin, I saw people get well. Uh, traditionally trained physicians don't often see people get well. They often see them get better. In, in some areas, for instance, in orthopedics, you set the bone, it heals, and the patient is well. Uh, but when you're dealing with diseases, you don't see people get well. In fact, you go from one drug to another drug to a plethora of drugs to m multiple drugs. And so people really don't get well if they're going up this scale of pharmaceutical intervention for uh, symptoms of disease. Both at Pritikin and also here at Whitaker Wellness, we see people come off a drug, come off of a drug, come off of a drug, not because they have this philosophical rage against drugs, but simply because the reason for the drug has been eliminated. That would be wellness. So all of a sudden we're starting to see that these diseases that seem to be manifesting through the population, where we attributed them to, to genetics and biochemistry, really turn out to be all connected to lifestyle and how we respond to the stimuli of life. And uh, by reprogramming that, we are empowered to change the biology as well. 
early on in my life, I had a standard American diet, a very typical diet. I was very sickly. I was cloudy in my focus. I had terrible skin. I had PMS. I had the worst constipation on the planet, and I was miserable. Over the years, I gradually evolved because I do believe that you don't necessarily go from A to Z overnight. And as I evolved and changed, my health improved, my vitality improved, and my lifestyle absolutely improved 100%. It wasn't only that I didn't gain weight or gain wrinkles that other women in my age are going through that. It's the clarity. It's the focus. I sleep three and a half, four hours a night. I run five to six businesses. I'm never tired. I'm never sick. I like to think I'm always pleasant and loving toward people. Um, it's just a totally different way. And I can certainly say this was not what I enjoyed my entire life, coming to this whole change of how I think, how I feel, how I eat. My lifestyle changing has changed everything around me and the people around me too, which goes to prove if you make yourself number one, if you make the positive changes for yourself, which is the only thing we'll ever be given control over, it spreads out to everything around you. Suffering is the most powerful agent of change there is. That's why we have suffering on the planet. Because until someone is suffering, they won't change anything. They won't move, they won't do anything. But when pain is present, they're gonna move. They're gonna open up to different ideas. They're going to say, hey, maybe this whole thing that I've been doing is all wrong. Maybe I need to do that. I look at suffering as a good thing. It, it's part of the dynamic of balance in our universe, the balance of opposites. Disease cannot exist where there is balance. Where there is balance, there is a sense of a person being at ease. When a person releases their sense of ease by the choices they make, they have a soft drink or coffee or they refine carbohydrates or they refuse to exercise or they act out in an inappropriate manner, they either don't express or overexpress or exaggerate their expression of what's, what's causing their angst. They build a rage or they repress everything and go into a sense of despondency and depression. All of that, every second, 24 hours a day, is causing hormonal fluctuations. And the hormone fluctuations directly leads to a person having then physiological changes in their blood chemistry and in their body. Every time you get stressed, cortisol goes up. When cortisol goes up, then insulin goes up. And so you have insulin, cortisol, and all these different biological markers cascading up or down depending upon whether you're in a good mood or a bad mood. Food creates stress if it creates a lot of work for, for itself to digest and therefore cortisol, the stress hormone, goes up. And when cortisol is high, your body actually can't get into a deep phase of sleep, it's called delta. And when that happens, you're not regenerating your body during night and you wake up, you feel tired because you haven't slept efficiently. So the first thing that happens is people crave coffee and sugar because that stimulates the adrenal glands, it gets you going, but it's, it's just false energy. What you really wanna try and do is reduce stress and a large part of that can be done through better nutrition, through raw foods. Conventional medicine is based on Newtonian physics, which is everything is matter is relevant and everything not material is not relevant. And this is totally incorrect because uh, we live in a quantum mechanical universe which everything is energy including matter and invisible forces actually give shape to matter. Quantum mechanics comes in and reveals that the mind is more powerful in shaping matter than anything else. It's not just a body like a vehicle but there's a driver and the driver is separate from the vehicle but the, how the driver drives the vehicle determines how well the vehicle maintains itself and whether it stays healthy Conventional medicine treats the body as a vehicle without a driver. It's like a programmed machine, like genetic programming. So if there's something wrong, then we say, oh, the programming is off and the chemistry is off and we have to fix it. But they ignore the role of the mind of the driver because the mind can change the genetic activity and rewrite the genes and that's been left out of the equation. You put that back in and we, we mix the energy and the matter back together again. And, and make a whole out of it. So we're either gonna to choose to stay uninformed and a victim, in which case, help me, 
Is today Tuesday? Let me put on my merit badge. I'm in pain today. I suffer. Hand me a Twinkie. Or you'll say, enough of this. Enough. I'm ready. I'm ready for my own life. Turn it on. I'm ready to be responsible for my own life. I'm ready to examine the consequence of each choice I make. And I'm going to look ahead and ask myself, everything in life is an exchange. Every single thing we do is an exchange of energy. So if today when I wake up, if I exchange that big, fat, laden cheeseburger or the bacon and, and sausages and, and the sugar-coated syrup, and if I exchange that instead for a nice, healthy protein drink with some berries in it, and a good walk, and a nice positive thought and affirmation for the day, then there's gonna be an outcome that I'm gonna be happy with. I've seen amazing results in people who turn to a raw foods diet or a partial raw foods diet. I've seen people overcome cancer, diabetes, heart disease, depression. I've seen people throw out their antidepressant drugs after doing raw foods for just three or four weeks. It's really that powerful. I mean, this is the medicine that your body craves. This is what balances your body. In your DNA, you have a blueprint for healing. All you have to do really is activate it. And to activate it, you need to wake it up with those signals from natural medicines, all those phytochemicals from plants. Those go into your body, they circulate to your cells and tissues and organs, and they activate that healing potential from the inside out. And then, you're not just masking symptoms anymore. You're not just controlling blood sugar or managing disease. Instead, you're doing something far more powerful. You're actually healing from the inside out. You're actually curing disease and preventing disease from ever spreading in your body again. That's the power of raw foods. You don't get that from cooked foods. You don't get that from pharmaceuticals. You only get that from nature, living nature, live raw foods gives you that kind of potential. We have an, the most overweight population ever in the history of the human race and it's still growing fatter. Food addictions, refined sugar, saturated fats, fast foods, childhood obesity. Our society is in the midst of a serious health crisis that is out of control. People are dieting in record numbers but the problem is growing worse. If raw foods can reverse diabetes, can they also work for weight loss? What we call addiction is someone has certain needs and they haven't found a better way to fulfill them. So I believe there are six human needs, a need for certainty, which is comfort, and food is an easy way to do that. So cigarettes, so is alcohol, so is drugs for some people, and it meets that need. Now you can get certainty by kind of control everybody, or you can do it by eating a certain food or taking a certain drug, or you can get certainty by your faith, or you can get certainty by accomplishing things. There's lots of ways to do it. Some are destructive, some are more proactive or empowering. Uh, we need uncertainty. We need variety. And a lot of times people think about eating raw foods and they go, well, there's only so much I can eat, you know? Well, when you look at what most people eat, it's pretty habitual, you know? But we want that change in flavors in our mouth, that change of state that comes that food can provide. You know, we have a need to feel significant, unique, important. So some people are like cheese connoisseurs or, a, you, know, a, you know, a certain form of alcohol. You know, they know everything about every wine. So we're meeting an emotional need, not just a physical one. We have a need for connection and love. And if we feel alone and separate, going out and smoking that cigarette or going out and eat that food is like a way to connect and give yourself a little reward. And then we all need to grow. We all need to contribute. But those needs are usually the last looked at by people. So... Being able to find a better way to meet those needs is the way to do it. You never get rid of something, you always replace it. If you try to just stop doing something, it won't last. As I say, discipline never lasts, fulfillment does. So if you can find another way to be fulfilled, like now you have more energy from this, or now you feel free of something, or now you have a pride that you took control of your life and you took yourself to another level, those things can now move you in a direction that has a lasting impact. Americans eat a diet where 51% of calories come from processed foods with no, with no micronutrients in them, no phytochemicals, no antioxidants. Another 40% of the American diet is animal products, which don't, don't contain vitamin E and C and K and folate and bioflavonoids and lignans, and, and they don't contain those antioxidants and phytochemicals that, that we know are necessary for human nutrition. So I'm saying here is that a bagel is just like a piece of chicken. It's the same thing. It doesn't contain the phytochemicals and the antioxidants humans are starving for.
So food supplies with macronutrients, macronutrients are those calorie-containing nutrients, fat, carbohydrate, and protein, right? And Americans eat too many macronutrients. They make us fat. And an increase or an excess of any macronutrient is, is dangerous to our health. Too much fat, Americans eat too much fat, we have to eat less fat. Americans eat too much carbohydrate, we eat less carbohydrate. Americans eat too much protein, we have to eat less protein. We have to eat less of all four, all three macronutrients. But we have to eat more of micronutrients in the process. When your diet is deficient in micronutrients, it makes you want to eat more macronutrients. In other words, when you're not meeting your micronutrient needs, you have to overeat, and it creates food addictions, and, and you actually feel ill if you're not constantly putting food in the mouth every hour or two. So you don't meet your micronutrient needs, you have to overeat, you have to be overweight. I mean, whatever someone's gonna eat, I always say to them, you know, if you're gonna have a concentrated food, or whether, whether it's a protein or whether it's a carbohydrate, have a big salad, you know, have some vegetables, have something that's alive, ideally, as the start of that process, because it starts to fill you up, and you start, you know, not feeling so, you, you get satiated on good things instead of satiated on bad things. Food is a very addictive substance, but keep in mind that the addictiveness has to do with the build of the toxicity in your tissues. That if cells don't meet their nutrient needs, they build up toxins. If we take in calories without nutrients, without sufficient micronutrients, toxins build up in the cells. We utilize nut these nutrients to process calories. We stop eating for a few hours. It's when you're not digesting food is the, the time when the body can do most effectively repair and detoxify and remove the, the extra things, the excesses it doesn't need. So that's when we feel ill, when the when digestion stops, because feeling ill is mobilizing a lot of these toxic waste products for removal. People don't like feeling ill. The word addiction means that you, if you try to stop doing something that's harmful, you get discomfort, so humans don't want to feel uncomfortable, so they have a tendency to want to keep doing the same habits that cause the problem to begin with. We all know that those comfort foods we go for are under stress. And most people are under stress because their idea of how life's supposed to be doesn't match their current life. And when that stress happens, we got three choices. Blame something, you know, blame our environment, blame some person, blame ourselves, and blame doesn't change anything. Or you gotta make a change in that environment. You gotta change your life conditions or change your mindset. That's not an easy thing to do. It's much easier to do when you got people around you that support you. But people every day go out and their friends or family make fun of them and go, that's, you know, so-and-so's food. And at the same time, people still see the difference in them and then they start to get hooked. One very impressive weight reduction story is that of Angela Stokes, who was a living testimony of the power of a raw vegan diet. And she is so happy that she made a change to eating raw food. Remember, if you really want to make a positive change in your lifestyle for the better, you can do it. Basically, my story with raw foods is that I lost about 160 pounds from eating this way. Um, I used to weigh nearly 300 pounds. I was morbidly obese. I was in the category of people who were more or less killing themselves from the way they're eating. This was taken maybe five or six years ago, something like that. This was at the point when I was kind of nearly 300 pounds. Um, and this is an after photo. This is also the after. I can remember walking down the street and going from like McDonald's into Burger King into McDonald's, you know, just constant thousands upon thousands of calories a day and primarily processed starches and refined sugars. So this was um, May 2002 when my whole life completely changed. I was living in Iceland and my best friend was my homeopath. And she could see how closed I was, that I was not interested in um, discussing anything to do with health with anybody else. But she could also see that I was very ill and that I needed help. So she saw that it needed an indirect approach and she said to me one day, would you like to borrow a book? And I said, yeah, sure, okay. And she gave me a stack of books and one of them hidden in there was The Royal Family by the Batenkos. So the Batenkos are a Russian family who live here in the States and they are amazing. They're a family, a whole family that went raw and cured themselves of all kinds of conditions. So we're talking about juvenile um, diabetes, uh, arrhythmia, um, obesity, asthma, all kinds of things and they completely transform their lives and this book is their testimony of what happened for them. Um, so I started to read this book and I couldn't stop. I just, for some reason on that night, in that moment, this book just spoke to me and it was like my message. 
and I knew that from that point there was no going back. I read the whole book in one go and I just felt like this is my answer. I had never had any interest in diets or slimming pills or anything like that. And then I read this book and it was like, there's nothing to question. You know, why would I not do this? I, there's nothing for me to lose in doing this except all this weight. I had huge wrangles in my head that night, I can tell you, like trying to convince the part in me that was completely addicted to junk food that this was a good idea. That wasn't an easy battle to win, but um, the next day I did it. I went 100% raw vegan overnight after reading that book from being the person who literally could not walk past a McDonald's. That's who I used to be. And then I went 100% raw vegan. And um, that's a pretty crazy thing to do when you're in that kind of position. And it's not something that I recommend for other people to do um, if you're coming from that kind of background that I was. Because the detox is phenomenal. And everyone thought I'd gone crazy. My jaw was just in chronic pain from chewing so much because I'd always been eating all of these like sloppy foods that required no chewing and suddenly there I was you know grazing on nuts um, but it worked that was the important thing I started to see the changes and so did everybody else around me it was almost as if you could see the weight burning off me in the beginning it was it was phenomenal When it comes to um, uh, weight loss, I just want to say that because a lot, lot of people are so involved with keeping skinny and staying, keeping the weight down and going on a million diets. Forget about diets. If you do this, the raw vegan diet, organic vegan diet, you will never have to worry about weight. Because before, when I was into cooked food and, and meats and everything else, I was always on a diet, always. Now I got to eat food, I got to make sure every day I get enough avocados and bananas and raw nuts so I can keep the weight on. You know, I don't want to get too gaunt and too skinny because then people think I'm not healthy. So it's so easy to get thin. You, you eat the raw foods and you, you watch your salt intake. I do think a lot of, um, you know, people who are into raw vegan, they go to a lot of restaurants and there's a lot of high salt foods. But to control that, you just basically make your own juices, you know, eat your raw nuts and the raw fruits and the salads. And you're on a very great diet that will give you everything you need and for your beauty, for your health and longevity. By its very nature, living food diet, raw food diet, at least 80%, will naturally bring you to your optimal weight. I'm the same weight as when I graduated high school. It's pretty optimal weight, and it has not varied since I've been on live food since 1983. If you're way overweight, you will lose weight down to your natural weight. And the average we see is about 100 pounds a year. Now remember, we're not talking about deprivation. We're talking about a pleasurable diet, a good tasting diet. So it is not about deprivation, okay? It is just the natural way to eat and live that naturally brings you to that. And why do you lose weight? Because you can eat half as much and get all the nutrition that you need. We see obese people become thin and thin people become strong. And why this is, is when you nourish the human body, it has an inherent sense to regulate and balance itself. When people are thin to begin with because they highly metabolize food, they may be athletes, they may be under a lot of pressure or stress, we certainly greatly encourage weightlifting exercises to them. Additionally, when people are losing weight, it's not aerobics that burn fat most, it is weightlifting that burns fat most. Not to say that both groups shouldn't weightlift and both groups shouldn't do aerobic exercise. Because to be healthy, that is a big part of being healthy. It's not all food. You know, when people say we are what we eat, I would say we are what we metabolize. You know, you know we, we either gonna break this down and we're gonna be able to use it or we have to eliminate it. And if you're not using it and you're eliminating, that's wasted energy. Everybody has some things you're gonna consume that obviously have to go through that process. But more alive foods give you a greater concentration of what your body can use with a lot less energy to be able to break it down. And that difference, it's physical, you can feel it.
if toxic substances come into the body, if they're allowed into the body, they interfere with the propagation of signals because signals are carried by many times chemical and electrochemical uh, pathways. And if I have toxins in the system, the toxins distort the signal, and the distorted signal, you know, derives a distorted result. So therefore, yes, toxins interfere with the ability of the system to stay in balance and homeostasis. Detox is very difficult for, for people. When you begin to shift your way of life, all of those old patterns and all of the um, chemicals that are in the cells themselves that begin to be released, to begin to be transmuted, a person has to be very strong, very courageous, and have strong intention to move through that process. Getting the gunk out, it's like you know stirring up the mud. And it's gonna cause people to have high energy than low energy. It's gonna cause stuff to come out of their pores. It's gonna cause stuff to come out of their mouth. It's gonna cause all kinds of what we call detoxification episodes. And that's a little rough sometimes, but it's a good thing. I think once you really get on the natural food and you have a little bit of education around it, you realize that it's not the food that's doing it to you. It's your body saying, time to get out the garbage. Now we have enough energy, now we have the right kind of nutrients, now we have enough fiber, whatever, minerals, to get out the stuff that's excess. Cleansing and detoxifying our bodies, I believe, is the number one tool for staying healthy, young, and vibrant. I don't think it has anything to do necessarily with a title of being a vegan, a raw foodist, or a vegetarian. I think all of those things are wonderful, and they're great things to attain and to make our lives simpler and easier, but the reality is, to make everything work, we must cleanse and detoxify our bodies. I've met many, many raw foodists over the years that don't look much healthier than some of our meat eaters. I've met many vegetarians. I've met many raw foodists. I believe that the health that I enjoy continually for over 35 years is because I have been cleansing and detoxifying our bodies. We could pretend that we just have a little cell and we know we have billions and billions of cells. And what we do is we build up layer and layer of toxicity over the years because our bodies weren't meant to assimilate 99% of what most people are putting in their bodies. But this marvelous machine goes, okay, I'm going to do the best I can. It takes it in, but it has to take away from the other processes of the body regenerating itself. So when you cleanse and detoxify, you start to break down the layers of toxicity that you're building up. And you don't have to be eating improper foods to do that. Just driving around in a car, you're driving behind buses. I get my clothes dry cleaned. I eat what some people would call perfectly, and I cleanse and detoxify my body a minimum of four times a year. Right after we finished Super Size Me, we were still shooting, but it was right after I finished doing the diet myself for 30 days. Um, my wife, Alex, put me on a detox diet, um, a vegan detox, where basically she cut out all caffeine, all sugar, all processed foods. Um, you know, it was basically all, you know, whole fruits and vegetables, whole grains, you know, there was nothing um, with additives. You know, there was nothing that wasn't, uh, that wasn't in somehow based on a natural product. And I did this for eight weeks. And over the first few days, I mean, I felt myself going through massive withdrawal like a drug addict. Um, I had massive headaches. Uh, like my head was pounding like crazy. Uh, I started sweating after a couple of days. I started getting the shakes. And I mean, it was, it was really, it was like going through withdrawal and it lasted, uh, it was almost exactly three days until I kind of had a breakthrough and then suddenly started to kind of feel a little bit better. But uh, I mean, but that was it. I went cold turkey on everything. Um, you know, it wasn't just a few things. And, uh, and I think that my body was, was reeling from it. When you go on a, on a fruitarian diet, you really, it's almost like, I call it a camouflaged fast. And uh, because fruit is like, it's so cleansing and so detoxifying. And, um, uh, you know, you're just like getting rid of poison and junk and everything that's accumulated for all my 27 years. I was like getting rid of so much so quickly. And though Jean Stanley had told me about the possible elimination crisis, I was not really prepared when those, when those things happened. Uh, what happened was that uh, I would get a lot of dizzy spells. And uh, I remember one time I was on the freeway and driving up 405 and all of a sudden dizzy spells and, and, and panicky and my heart was beating real fast and I knew what was happening. I knew I was getting into a, a, an elimination moment. When you start to detox, it's a really nice idea to be gentle with yourself, you know, get a lot of sleep, get a lot of rest, 
Um, I didn't do any of that stuff. <laughs> I was so out of connection with this body and I was so used to pushing this body all the time that that's, that's the situation that I created for myself. In my first week of going 100% raw vegan, I was on an adventure trip in the north of Iceland. I was whitewater rafting. I was abseiling. I was horse riding. I was like nearly 300 pounds and detoxing at like a phenomenal rate. So that was an interesting one, you know, that was, everyone thought I'd gone crazy for a start, all the other people that I was with, because, you know, like I explained, I was, you know, I was the person who was eating like three plates of pasta for lunch. There was never one of anything for me. It was always, you know, masses of food. And then suddenly there I was on this trip with a bag with just fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds and oils and seaweeds. You know, this was after abusing myself nonstop for 30 days on, on McDonald's. So, uh, you know, at the end of the detox diet, you know, my cholesterol had gone back to normal, my blood pressure had gone back to normal, my liver function had returned to normal. Um, you know, and so, you know, the question was, well, how much of that was just going on this diet and how much of it was like getting rid of all that other crap that I was shoveling into my, into my pie hole? Um, I don't know. Energy is life. I, I talk to people all the time and one of the things that people will talk about is all things they want to do in their life but they feel too tired or too exhausted or too burnt out or too stressed. And the first thing I say to them is start with your body. It's physiology first. You make a change in your physical body, you'll see that change in your mental, emotional, you know, spiritual aspect of your life. So I went initially on just an absolute cleanse. I went on a 10-day cleanse. I was going to do just watermelon. <laughs> I didn't quite do that, but I did for about six or seven days. And anybody who's been on a fast knows that the first two or three days are hell, and then you have more energy than when you're eating. It's bizarre. And then you begin to realize, wait, food is a source of fuel, but it's not the only source of fuel. You know, why do you wake up in the morning, you know, filled with energy? But if you can give yourself something that is alive, uh, you tend to feel more alive. I remember I had learned to always drive my car and always at home have a lot of bananas, like bananas at different stages because they are known to uh, slow down the elimination process when that happens really extreme. And if you take bananas when you're eliminating and you're getting these lightheaded spells, and it's also if you can combine that with lying down and lift up your leg higher than your head, and of course breathing slowly, you know, breathing, breathing slowly and relaxing and, and thinking spiritual thoughts and praying, you know, that's what I was doing. I would lie down in my car and it would take, I don't know, 15, 20, 30 minutes, I'd sit down on the side of the, freeway and people are looking you know what I was doing because I was sit sitting down lying down the back seat with my feet planted up on uh, the seat uh, in front of me and always like clockwork that would work for me the deep breathing the bananas and relaxing and praying and uh, my elimination would always slow down with that but for me I think that you know I felt better after doing her detox diet and um, and to this day, you know, like for a few weeks a year, um, you know, usually for like two or three weeks, sometimes four. I haven't done the full eight weeks since, uh, since I did the movie, but I'll go for like two to three weeks, sometimes four weeks, and just detox out, get rid of sugar, not drink caffeine, um, you know, uh, cut meat out of my diet or something for, for an extended period of time. Anytime you take a person off a very unhealthy regimen, they're going to feel better for four or five days through the detoxing and rebalancing process. They will go through mood swings and energy swings, blood sugar swings, their whole biochemistry is shifting. But a real detox takes about two years, not two days or two weeks. A real detox you're not gonna do with some bentonite clay and some lemon and apple cider uh, vinegar juice. The cells have chromosomes and telomeres the aging clock. When those cells have been damaged, everything speeds up. You're speeding up your aging clock. It's repairing the damage to the DNA that is necessary to reverse the disease process. Because our bodies are in a self-regenerating mode, we have a God force flowing through all of us of healing. If you cut your finger and you do nothing to it, doesn't it heal up? The entire body was designed to do that. And all of your challenges, from diabetes to cancer to Crohn's disease, these are just the body screaming, I have too much toxicity. I need a way to show you to make a change. Unfortunately, in our world, we're taught to compartmentalize the body and work on specific areas with a lot of chemicals. Well, I certainly would never 
never tell anybody to not go to a doctor or not to do something that's comfortable for them. What I do stress is educate yourself and try detoxifying. I've been interviewed many times over the years and they always say to me, how do you know this is true, Karen? Well, I don't have any type of scientific background. And my general answer is try it. Try it for one week. Cause and effect, there's no way it can't work. There's no way. You can give me a million scientific reasons of why it may not work, but if you do it, the body is designed to work. It's designed to regenerate itself. This is what we're meant to do. Whenever you change your life, there's some kind of detox that's going to happen. Uh, we, we have strong coping mechanisms, defense mechanisms, um, compulsive behaviors that we've developed to make it through life. And when, when, when you change your life, all of those are challenged. You think those are your friends. When in fact, maybe years ago they were your friends to help you make it through a particular time in your life, but now uh, they hinder the process. And you know, it's not hard to figure out that a watermelon and a steak are going to break down with a little different impact on your body. Now, I'm not saying go eat watermelon only, but if the more you can put yourself in a position where you're taking in 70%, let's say, water content foods, alive foods, you're going to feel that effect at two levels. Your body will start to cleanse because it has energy. It's not being used up because we use so much energy up just in digestion. You know, food's supposed to digest in three or four hours, and for many people, it's digesting seven or eight hours because we so overload the system. And we don't just overload it with the amount of food, but we'll overload it with coffees and soda pops and all these other drinks that the body's gotta figure out how to deal with. So, common sense says, if you wanna be alive, eat live foods. I'm a big proponent of cleansing the body, detoxifying, and I don't believe that there is only one method. I believe there are many roads to the top of the mountain. It's finding what resonates for you. So people say to me all the time, well, which one is the best one, Karen? Is yours the best? Is this one the best? Is that one the best? You know the best one? The one you'll do the one that resonates with you, the one that you'll do, and the one where the person teaching is resonating with what you need to learn for yourself. You know, a raw food diet is perfect for the best health possible. Even top-notch athletes are choosing it. So if you want to be at your very best, listen up. I first got into nutrition when I realized that that was going to be what made me successful as an athlete or didn't. I first got into triathlon when I was around 15 and I realized that to be successful of course I'd have to train a huge amount. So what I did is I looked at some of the top athletes training programs and I looked at just average athletes training programs. What really surprised me is that there's very little difference between the top in the world and just the average. So of course my question to myself was what separates number one from those who are just kind of mid-pack if the training program's the same? What I realized was that it has to do with what happens in between training. It has to do with recovery. And a huge part of recovery has to do with nutrition. And I tried a whole bunch of different ty types of eating plans. I tried high carb, low carb, high protein, low protein, all these different things. And some, some were better than others, but usually they weren't good. There was nothing I found that was really good. And then I tried a completely plant-based diet. So no animal products at all, no dairy, no, no eggs, no, no honey. And at first it didn't work well. I was tired, I was hungry, I didn't recover well. I was lethargic. Um, and recovery was, was, was really bad and that was a big problem because I couldn't train much. So I found that if I wanted to, to eat a plant-based diet, I would have to learn more about it. And I found the things I was lacking was vitamin B12, iron, calcium, omega-3 fatty acids, complete protein. I found plant-based sources for all these different foods, blended them together, and had a blender drink every day. And eventually, that is what evolved into what is now Vega. But that's how it started back when I first made it for myself. And it worked really well. My recovery was so much better. I was able to actually train more than other people, therefore I improved quicker and was able to start my professional career much earlier than I would have had I not paid close attention to detail and recovery. And that was really the only thing that separated me from, from other athletes who I improved faster than. It's not more talent, it's not, not any, anything other than different nutrition tr program. The reason my recovery was faster than other people's, faster than my competition, was because I was eating lots of raw food. And the thing with raw food is that 
it digests so much more easily. It's got digestive enzymes and therefore I didn't have to expend the energy to digest it. When you eat food, doesn't matter what kind, your body has to break it down. If it doesn't have enzymes, your body has to build enzymes, which is fine. A healthy body can do that, but it takes work. And if you're spending energy building enzymes and digesting, assimilating food, the net gain of that food is so much smaller. So the total amount you get from it is just not there. Even though you've taken a lot of calories, what you're left with is pretty minimal. With nutrition, you gain energy, so you find out how you can dive better or perform better. I'm interested in raw foods, and I've been taking them for some time. I've started with vitamins and minerals, and uh, raw foods is where it comes from. So I got into raw foods as much as I could. It's my wife and I, when we got married, we got starting with carrot juice. We started eating carrot, drinking carrot juice. From there, we found out that we could uh, take raw vegetables and mix them all together, uh, as well as carrot juice, and with the carrot juice, and we drank that. It was regular for us, and we gave it to our kids. And uh, our kids have all grown up healthy. I found that uh, many of the divers, as they grew older, they racked up all kinds of problems. And a good many of the divers have had knee replacements, hip replacements, uh, back surgery, heart surgery. I've had none of those. And with good nutrition, uh, you not only live longer, but you perform better with the nutrition that you take. My name is Victor Kanda, and I've been raw for four years. I do uh, mixed martial arts, and uh, it's been an incredible change for me. My health, physically, mentally, and spiritually, I have to say. What I am getting from the raw food in my stamina. Level of stamina was, is actually excellent. I would say that it's 70% better from the time being on rock. The raw has been absolutely awesome in many different areas. Like, uh, I injury less. I do a lot of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, a lot of mixed martial arts. And I train, you know, four or five, even six times a week. Running on the beach, bicycle, and a lot of sparring, tournaments. And I can see that with people who are half my age, you know, I'm 44. People who have been training in 20, 21 years old, and they injury more often than me. Actually, I almost had no injury. Training more than they are training. I'm 53 years old, and when I was obviously a teenager in my early 20s, I was in the United States World Team in figure skating. I was second in the United States in pair skating with my sister Gail, and I was third in the World Professional Pairs Championships in 1976, and tried to get back in skating again in time for the Olympics. I was a very avid ice skater most of my youth, and I was, and even after that time, I trained athletes. I do a lot of work with athletes in my practice. And what's interesting is that a lot of these world-class athletes I work with, um, we realize that it's not going to affect their performance greatly being on a better by being on a worse diet or a better diet. But what it really does affect is whether they get sick or not um, coming through. And they can't if they, unless they can train consecutively for like six months straight they're not going to reach their maximum performance level. And then they're going to, then if they're a world-class skier, let's say, they're going to miss their event if, if, they, if they get sick with a, a flu or a cold a couple of weeks before their two big events, they're not going to be the top five in the world or top ten in the world. Where they're, up, they're going to lose their opportunity. When you're a top athlete, a top tennis player, or a top basketball player, or a top baseball player, when you're a top athlete, a top soccer player, whatever you are, you can't be in bed sick and expect to beat the top of your form. And these athletes who shake people's hands and travel all over the place, they, they say, well, can, can I help them, because they've had known from their past, go through the season and not get sick, and not catch a cold, and not get a flu? And I say, yeah, we've got to get your nutrient. And, and it works. And these athletes have said to me, wow, you might have saved me $500,000 this year, because I was able to go, because my, my success on the, on the tour was because I, didn't, I got to every single event in great shape. I didn't, I didn't lose any time in bed, I didn't lose any time off the schedule, I didn't miss an event. And I found that when I was a world-class figure skater, the advantage we had, I think, was that we d were able to continue a high level of training and not be interrupted by so many illnesses that other people have. As a former uh, college-level athlete, I have found 40 years later, or 45 years later at this point, at the age of 65, that there is more strength, what do I mean more strength? I could do 70 push-ups as captain of an undefeated college football team and National Football Hall, Hall of Fame football player. 
And now at age of 60, I could do 601, and the endurance has increased uh, way beyond what I had in, in my 20s, the flexibilities. I could barely get my hands to my knees uh, when I was 20, and now I could put my hands on the floor.